Beale is in the house. So um, are you able to, hopefully you're able to stay for the um, group discussion at the end, Anil? Um, and yeah, yeah, I will. Excellent. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to hand you over to another. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Neil. Thank see you, you in so the as well. Thanks for, your, <laughs> thanks for your slide, Nabil. Cheers. Take care, guys. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. <laughs> so uh, Nabil, um, uh, Nabil is another uh, old colleague and uh, good friend um, who is uh, another expert in uh, cardiac imaging, including cardiac MRI, um, inherited cardiac conditions, uh, and uh, has done a lot of work with athletes and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in particular. Um, so Anil uh, is a consultant at uh, St Thomas's and um, he's going to talk to us about the athlete's heart versus inherited cardiac conditions, which is quite a common uh, dilemma that we see uh, when when we are assessing athletic individuals. So uh, Nabil, thanks very much and I'll hand over, okay. over to you. Brilliant. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, Abbas, and for inviting me here to give this talk this afternoon. So as Abbas says, I'm going to talk to you today on athlete's heart versus inherited cardiac condition. So there's an awful lot to cover, actually. I'm going to start by some aims and objectives. So um, to begin with, um, we're going to have a very quick revision of the athlete's heart and what this means. In particular, I want to look at the overlap that occurs between athlete's heart and pathology. And we'll look at both ECG changes with a focus on T-wave inversion because this is the most common change that we come across in day-to-day -day clinical practice. But we'll also look at some structural changes that can overlap um, between athlete's heart and pathological cardiac conditions, such as chamber dilatation and increased wall thickness. I'm then going to go on to talk about how to differentiate athlete's heart from cardiomyopathy. And again, I'm going to focus predominantly on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because that's the most frequent dilemma we come across in, in clinical practice. But I'll also um, briefly touch upon arrhythmogenic and dilated cardiomyopathies. And then finally, I think it's important not to forget that athlete's heart can also overlap with the phenotype of ion channel disorders. So we'll very, very quickly look at uh, two examples with long QT syndrome and Brigada syndrome. So to begin with, um, long-term intensive exercise leads to a number of cardiac adaptations, which collectively are known as the athlete's heart. These include electrical changes, which we can see on the surface ECG, for example, sinus bradycardia and voltage criteria for chamber enlargement, um, but also structural changes, which we see on uh, cardiac imaging, such as increases in cavity dimensions and wall thickness. And together, these changes usually reflect the underlying functional changes that are occurring in an athlete in order to increase their stroke volume several fold during intensive exercise. And for the vast majority of athletes, um, these changes fall well within the remit of those that are recognised as normal physiology. However, in a small but significant proportion of athletes, some of these changes may overlap with those seen in pathological cardiac conditions. These include repolarization anomalies on the ECG, including T-wave inversion, but also changes to the QT interval, and um, also structural changes, including increases in cavity dimension and wall thickness beyond what we would expect in a, in a particular athlete demographic. Now, in order to facilitate the differentiation of normal from pathological ECG changes, these international recommendations for ECG interpretation in an athlete were published in 2017. You can see here they, they set out very nicely normal ECG findings in an athlete in the green box. So things such as increased voltage criteria for chamber enlargement, sinus bradycardia, um, borderline changes which should only occur in isolation, and abnormal ECG findings, which should clearly um, require further investigation. And from these um, abnormal ECG findings, I'm going to concentrate on T-wave inversion and show you how that can overlap with uh, inherited cardiac conditions. So this is data from various studies from throughout the world in adult Caucasian athletes. And we can see that the prevalence of T-wave inversion is anywhere from zero to 9%, so not, not that infrequent. However, it must be remembered that T-wave inversion can be a normal um, finding in an athlete. For example, take this 14-year-old athlete who's got T-wave inversion in V1 to V3, 
And this is the normal juvenile ECG pattern. So, so the paediatric population often do exhibit T-wave inversion in the right precordial leads. And this is reflective of, of the right-sided dominance that, that exists during development. In addition, we now know that T-wave inversion up to V2 is also a normal finding in athletes and observational studies have shown um, that the vast majority of these individuals have no evidence of pathology. So the data I've shown you so far has been from Caucasian cohorts. What about other ethnicities? So this is data published by Michael Papadakis back in 2011, and it looks at the prevalence of T-wave inversion in adult black athletes. And you can see from this that almost a quarter of this cohort exhibit T-wave inversion. So uh, several fold greater than the Caucasian, uh, than their Caucasian counterparts. And if we look at the data very, very carefully, we see that the vast majority of T-wave inversion in black athletes is usually confined to the anterior precordial leads V1 to V4. And work I've done in adolescent athletes has shown exactly, a set, exactly the same pattern in, in um, adolescent black athletes, although to a smaller magnitude. So therefore, we now recognize this particular pattern of T-wave inversion confined to V1 to V4, particularly if um, associated with preceding convex ST segment elevation in an otherwise asymptomatic uh, uh, black athlete with no family history as a normal physiological response to exercise. However, we have to also remember that T-wave inversion is a feature of cardiomyopathies, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which together account for at least 40% of cases of sudden cardiac death. So it becomes apparent why differentiation be between normal and abnormal T-wave inversion becomes so, so important in day-to-day -day clinical practice. And as I've mentioned in the beginning, it's also important to remember that T-wave inversion can also be a feature of ion channel disorders, including long QT syndrome and Brigada syndrome, which are both um, associated with T-wave inversion. OK, so those are the ECG changes and T-wave inversion in particular. Let's move on to look at some of the structural changes that may overlap um, in, um, in athletes between physiology and pathology. So this is data from just over 1,300 Italian Olympic athletes, and it shows, it's a bar chart showing the distribution of LV cavity dimensions. And we can see just by looking at this, that a significant proportion of athletes exhibit LV cavity dimension. Um, and indeed, if we look at this data more closely, we see that actually almost a quarter of male athletes in this cohort exhibited uh, LV cavity dimensions exceeding 60 millimetres, which then overlaps with the phenotype of a dilated cardiomyopathy. We have to also remember that in, um, in practice, a lot of these athletes also have a resting sinus bradycardia. And when we look at the LV function at rest, it looks low normal with an ejection fraction of between 50 to 55%. Um, and that's really because they've got such large stroke volumes that the heart at rest needs to beat less vigorously, but it really can look like a DCM. And I'll show you an example of this later on in the talk. Moving on to left ventricular hypertrophy, this also occurs in athletes in response to exercise. This is again data for Michael Papadakis' um, um, uh, study. And we can see that a small but significant proportion of athletes exhibit wall thicknesses exceeding 12 millimetres, which would then overlap with the phenotype of morphologically mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And again, if we look at this data closely, we see that this problem affects black athletes more than it does white athletes. And finally, if we look at right ventricular dilatation in athletes, this is data published by Dr. Zaidi. Um, in 2013, the first paper to look at right ventricular remodeling in, in Afro-Caribbean athletes. And he showed in this study that a significant proportion of athletes exhibit um, changes that would overlap with the changes that we see in right-sided arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, meeting at the major ARBC task force criteria for the condition, at least on chamber dimension. Of course, you need other features to, to, to fully meet the criteria, but it just goes to show the overlap between normal physiological remodeling and uh, right-sided arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. 
So given all of this, what can we do to differentiate normal physiolo physiology from a pathological cardiac condition? Well, I think to start off with, there's some general principles that we can follow that, um, that apply to all um, uh, conditions. So obviously the first thing we start off with is history and examination. So any symptoms, family history, examination findings are suggestive of pathology. We can then look on, go on to look at broader phenotypic features. So, for example, we may do a cardiopulmonary exercise test to look at the VO2 max, uh, do a treadmill test to look at exercise induced arrhythmias, arrhythmias on halter, and of course, fibrosis on MRI. And again, if any of these are positive, that may be more suggestive of pathology. And finally, we mustn't forget the um, powerful tool of familial screening. So if we're faced with an athlete with ECG and structural changes, we screen their first degree relatives and we see similar changes in them. This may be indirect evidence that the changes we're seeing in our athletes are also pathological. So moving on from general principles to specific conditions, and let's start by looking at athlete's heart versus HCM. And the challenge in day-to-day -day clinical practice is when we're faced with an athlete who has a T-wave inversion on the ECG and this grey zone of wall thickness between 13 to 15 millimetres. So obviously after our, our history and examination, the next thing we do is a 12 lead ECG. This is a 12 lead ECG from a normal healthy athlete and you can see a lot of the features shown in that green box I showed you earlier from the international criteria. So we have a resting sinus bradycardia with voltage criteria, isolated voltage criteria for chamber enlargement. And contrast this with an ECG from a HCM patient where we've got gross repolarization changes, which are usually associated with resting ST segment depression. And importantly, these extend beyond V2 into the lateral and the inferior lead. So infralateral T wave inversion should always be regarded as um, something mandating further investigation in an athlete. Moving on to starting to image the heart. And the first thing we look at is the presence and magnitude of LVH. Observational studies have allowed us to determine the upper limits of normal that we should expect in certain cohorts of athletes and magnitudes of left ventricular hypertrophy beyond these reference limits in athletes, again, should raise suspicion of HCM or morphologically mild HCM. When we're echoing uh, athlete, we also look at the pattern of the LVH. So in athlete's heart here shown on the left, we see homogeneous LVH, so in a concentric pattern with less than a two millimeter difference between adjacent segments. Whereas in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we often see very asymmetric and bizarre patterns like this cardiac MRI example of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, a lot's been said about the left ventricular cavity in HCM and that the um, LVH occurs at the expense of the LV cavity, in other words, concentric remodeling. And because of this, usually the LV cavity is normal or reduced. Um, but a word of warning when it comes to athletes with HCM. This is data that I myself published during my PhD in 2015. And what I did was look looked at about 100 athletes we had on our databases who had HCM. I looked at their parameters at the time that they were actively exercising just before their diagnosis. And I found that actually athletes with HCM do exhibit a degree of LV dilatation. And this is probably just due to physiological remodeling. But the point is that LV cavity dilatation cannot be used itself to rule out HCM in athletes. A lot of um, systolic function can also be useful and in particular strain rate imaging, which is invariably normal or supranormal in an athlete, but may be reduced or attenuated in HCM and can actually be a very early marker of disease before any gross structural changes have occurred. A lot's again been said about diastolic function. Athletes have a nice compliant heart with good diastolic function, whereas HCM patients have a stiff heart with or a diastolic function. But again, the study that I um, published in 2015 showed that actually when it comes to athletes with HCM, the diastolic function may actually be normal or supranormal. So again, we have to be cautious when using this parameter alone to rule out HCM in an athlete. 
And finally, in terms of echocardiography, there's a number of different features. So systolic anterior motion, an outflow tract gradient at rest, which we shouldn't expect to see in an athlete, apart from maybe a degree of left atrial enlargement. So moving beyond echo, we then can go on to perform ambulatory ECG monitoring. And this is the kind of thing we're looking for. So non-sustained VT. And I, I, I shouldn't need to say that this should really be treated as pathological if seen in an athlete. Similarly, with um, exercise testing, we may see a blunted or reduced blood pressure response to exercise, which again is a feature of HCM and completely the opposite of what we expect in a normal healthy athlete, where blood pressure should continue to rise until peak exercise. Cardiac MRI scan, scanning has become standard and a very powerful tool to assess HCM and the presence of fibrosis, so these white areas, particularly in the hypertrophied segments, suggests that that LVH is pathological rather than physiological. And finally, detraining can be extremely useful. So if you take an athlete with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and convince them somehow to detrain for six to eight weeks, Regression of the LVH suggests it's physiological, whereas persistence suggests it's pathological. So just to summarise, these are the features that can help us distinguish between athlete's heart and HCM. I'm not going to go through them again. This slide is just there for your reference. So moving on, um, let's have a, a look at how athlete's heart may uh, overlap with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And when it comes to right-sided arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, the dilemma arises when we see an athlete with RV dilatation and T-wave inversion in the right precordial leads. In addition, we may see uh, incomplete or even complete right bundle branch block on the athlete's ECG and ventriculate topics of right ventricular origin. I'll show you an example of that in a second. So after our ECG history and examination, we go on to image the heart. The kind of things that we're looking for are RV di dimensions, which are beyond what we would expect from physiological remodeling alone. Here we see RVOT dilatation. We also take a look at the RV morphology, looking for subtle regional wall motion abnormalities. And cardiac MRI scan is better for this. Here we see obvious um, changes in the right ventricular free, free wall with um, clear aneurysms um, uh, apparent there. We can also look at RV systolic function, and this is invariably normal in an athlete, but both the TAPSI and the fractional area change may be reduced in patients with right-sided arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And in this cohort, they also develop ventricular tachycardia and ventricular ectopics of RV origin. So by that, I mean a left bundle branch block pattern, um, um, uh, suggesting that the, the, the uh, arrhythmia is coming from the right side. And with the case of RV outflow tract um, uh, VT or ectopics, we often see a inferior axis. So the VT is, or ectopics are positive in the inferior leads 2, 3 and ABF as shown here. And Holt monitoring may also show us other features, including a high ventricular ectopic burden of over 500 in 24 hours. Now, we mustn't forget that arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy can also affect the light, left side of the heart and cardiac MRI scanning has, has, has shown us this. So this is uh, an example of somebody with um, a desmo, a desmoplaque mutation. And we see this circumferential um, uh, left, um, uh, late, gadolinium, late gadolinium enhancement suggestive of circumferential scar. But if we take a look at the task force criteria, this is the challenge we face when it comes to arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And the diagnosis does rely on several modalities. So assessment of these athletes must be undertaken very, very carefully um, by um, experts in the field. So just a summary slide on athlete's heart versus arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, again, for your reference. Let's go on to look at how athlete's heart may um, overlap with dilated cardiomyopathy. And again, in clinical practice, the dilemma arises when we see an enlarged LV cavity with, as I've mentioned before, low normal resting ejection fraction. So I'll show you an example. This is a top premiership football player. And we can see that at rest, there is chamber enlargement and his LV function looks a little bit sluggish. When we do our measurements, we see uh, chamber dilatation of the magnitude of 62 millimetres and his EF comes out as around 51%. And in this situation, what we can do is do an exercise echo on the athlete. 
So what we're looking for on exercise is for all of the myocardial segments to start recruiting normally and for the uh, myocardium to wake up as it were. And studies, some studies have suggested that an increase in the ejection fraction by 12% or more by, um, compared from rest to exercise is strongly suggestive of normal physiology. So again, just a summary slide for you guys um, uh, regarding athlete's heart or DCM. A lot of the principles follow the same principles for the preceding um, conditions. So in the last minute or so, let's go on to look at the ion channelopathies. And first of all, athlete's heart versus long QT syndrome. So there are some inherent difficulties when measuring the QT interval in athletes, in particular, the presence of U waves. And we can overcome this by using something called the teach the tangent method, where we draw a horizontal line on the downslope of the T wave. And where this horizontal line intersects the isoelectric line, we use that point as the end point of the T wave, missing out the U wave altogether. And according to the international guidelines, the upper limits of normal in males and females in terms of correct acuity interval should be 470 and 480 respectively. However, some studies have shown that athletes may exhibit QT intervals beyond this, uh, these limits. And we know now that if an athlete has a corrected QT interval of over 500 milliseconds, this is likely to represent long QT syndrome. However, what about athletes with this gray zone of um, uh, QT prolongation? Well, I think we can only really make a diagnosis of long QT syndrome in this situation when one or more of the following features are present. So these are all features that are seen in long QT syndrome. So uh, sinister history, torsade de part VT, uh, family history of either long QT or SADS, abnormal T wave morphology such as notching or inversion, and paradoxical prolongation of the QT interval with exercise. Remember, your QT interval should normally shorten with exercise. And finally, athlete's heart and Brigada syndrome. So um, you'll all have known uh, know by now from your previous lectures that there are a number of uh, Brigada ECG patterns. So the type one pattern is the diagnostic pattern where we have coved SD segment elevation, but we can get intermediate patterns as well, such as type two and type three patterns, the so-called saddlebacked or cove saddlebacked patterns. And it, the question arises when we see these patterns in an athlete, does this represent Brigada syndrome? And my approach to this is to ask myself a few questions if I see the, these patterns in an ECG. First of all, does the athlete have any symptoms such as syncope? Um, does the athlete have any family history of concern such as sudden death or indeed a family history of Brigada? And finally, if we do a high lead ECG, uh, where we place V1 and V2 in the second interspace, which is more sensitive to pick up a type 1 pattern, do we see a type 1 pattern develop? And if the answer to all of these questions is no, then I leave the athlete well alone and just let them get on with things. If the answer is yes, then I may, I may just consider referring them for an adrenaline provocation test, but this should really be done after careful um, counselling. So just to summarise, athletic remodelling can produce electrical and structural changes with, uh, which overlap with those changes that we see in inherited cardiac conditions. Correct interpretation is obviously uh, crucial to avoid sudden cardiac death on the one hand and false disqualification on the other. And in many cases have we seen, particularly with the cardiomyopathies, multiple modalities are needed to help this differentiation. We have to um, refer on to, to, to people who, who have done this a lot. So I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry for running a bit over. Um, I'm happy to take any questions via email and during the panel discussion as well. Uh, and, uh, Nabil, sorry, Nabil, thank you um, very much indeed for that. Um, that was really nicely summarised um, and a huge amount of work um, that has gone in, into that. Um, over the last uh, 20 years now, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. and a lot of that has come from, from the St. George's group, from um, Sanjay Sharma, um, did a lot of that early work. Um, uh, so uh, I think we need to move on, actually, because in the interest of time. So um, if you're able to yeah. join us again at the end. I'm for the happy, to, happy to join in the panel discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um,